A couple of weeks ago, I gave a sermon dealing with our wants and our needs and how that God takes care of them. And we talked about that, and today I want to talk about how he suggested what we needed to do first, and I want to spend time on that. And that's from Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, where Jesus says here, and it's, it's about in the context of not worrying. So thankfully, in our world today, we have nothing to worry about. I say that tongue-in-cheek because I want, I want to read about what he says here. First, verse 33, but seek first, the, the, first the kingdom, his kingdom, and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So a very uh, encapsulating, comforting comment that God knows what our needs are. But I want to start back with, with where the context of this whole pericope, this, this subject matter is talking about, and that is where we as a people, his disciples, and he was concerned about his disciples worrying about it. So in that particular context, he, he tells them in verse uh, 25, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. And so what we want to talk about is it is in the context of, of your life. So in our life today, for example, let's just take a look at some of the things that could concern us. Some of the things that could concern us personally are, is our health, uh, is our own personal economy, uh, those that are around us, our friends, relatives, neighbors. Um, they, there would be bigger concerns that we have as a country. Uh, we have global concerns. <clears throat> You know, China this last week was talking about invading uh, Taiwan. The, the war is not, you know, out of the question there. We know Russia has invaded Crimea and annexed that, and Ukraine, you know, there's war going on there. The people in Yemen are starving to death. It is a, a huge, huge, uh, terrible problem in, in Yemen. We, we've got terrorism going on. We have uh, North Korea with the possibility of the nuclear bomb. Uh, I'm reminded of what Jesus said. You're going to hear about wars and rumors of war, but don't let your heart be troubled. So it is in this context we're going to talk about what Jesus says we need to do. We're going to talk about the latter part of it, but the first part of his, his uh, direction is also important. He says, but... In contrast to everything, but seek first his kingdom. So in the world in which we live, and this is important in terms of reducing the, 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 the amount of stress, the amount of anxiety that we as a, as a people might feel, and how to live life. Because it is about life, and uh, Jeanette read from what the Apostle Paul says, there is no condemnation in Christ, but we are led by the Spirit. We are led into a righteousness that is of God. And it is about his righteousness that Jesus is talking about. And our focus in our own personal life is about the kingdom of God. And it is easy enough for us to put off the kingdom of God until the fullness of the kingdom of God because we recognize that God's kingdom hasn't come in its fullness. However, in our own personal life, the kingdom of God should have come. Not in full, but in, in these areas that help us so much. And here are some of the ways in which the kingdom of God has come. God has sent his spirit, uh, God has sent his son rather, we just celebrated the birth of, of Jesus, the life of Jesus. God has sent his Holy Spirit, which is to guide, direct us, counsel us, and help us. God has given us a heavenly calling. We have a relationship with God uh, that we should feel a certain confidence in. Uh, there's a certain joy about living in this human life, living kingdomly, uh, even though, as they say, living kingdomly has its tensions and difficulties because when you live the kingdom of God in this kingdom, a divided kingdom, everything is divided everywhere in the light, it is difficult. 
Now, as we realize, even trying to live the kingdom within family has its difficulties, living the kingdom within, your, say, your neighborhood or, or your city or your state and like is difficult because people are not agreeable to the kingdom of God. And we find that personally, individually. I was telling um, uh, someone this morning that when on my prayer walk, often, oftentimes I find myself consumed with concerns. And, and that's all the, the time I have is praying about concerns. Let, let's get through the praise part to get to the concerns. But I have things that, God, I want you to be intervening in and helping. And, and oftentimes on that prayer walk, what I, what I miss is the kingdom. What I miss, for example, is, well, stop a moment, take a look up at the blue skies, at the beauty around you, at the creation, at the sights and the sounds. Realize, hey, you're, you're, you're standing upright still, and you're walking, and, and you're doing this and that. There, there are things God has blessed, and there are some incredible things that God is doing. And just stop for a moment to enjoy the kingdom. Enjoy the Holy Spirit. And, and actually on my prayer walk, the Holy Spirit has its place on my prayer walk. Now that's, that's an it. See, the Holy Spirit in my, in my prayer walk, where the Holy Spirit has its prayer, is as I go through, there's a section of pine trees, and when the wind is blowing through there, it makes this sound, like a mighty rushing wind. It's, it's a beautiful sound. It takes me all the way back, and Carol will know about this, Henniger Flats in, uh, in the San Gabriel Mountains when I came out to California in, in college or went up camping. We're up there high, the winds are blowing. This is the first time I've ever been in the mountains like that and enjoying it. And I'm just reminded always of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's my place to give thanks to God for dwelling in me. So we, we can live the kingdom. But in living the kingdom, what, what God has called us to do, and what Jesus says, His kingdom, not my kingdom, not America's kingdom or the kingdoms of the world, but His kingdom, and to live that kingdom now. And then, so I'm seeking that, because his kingdom is not of this world, if it were, he says, his servants would fight. But then he follows up, and this is what I want to focus on for us in the time we have here today. Seek his righteousness. Now, the, the defining thing here are two things. His, that is God, it belongs to him, his righteousness. And so, what is it about seeking righteousness that we might need to understand and to appreciate? Because I believe it is important for us to know, first of all, what righteousness is. Uh, because I believe, humanly, we have probably a different definition of what righteousness is than God has. Uh, and then, even as Christians, we have a different definition. And then we have the whole world definition of what righteousness is. I would suggest that possibly one of the biggest definitions in the world today of what righteousness is, is tolerance. Tolerate everything. Tolerance. Now, I'm not disputing that it's helpful, but I'm, I'm, I'm questioning tolerance as being God's righteousness. I'm just going to throw that out there for us to think about and then where does righteousness come from? So when we see Jesus' response to his disciples' concerns about life and its needs, and we read and we look at the word, and you look up the Greek word for righteousness, it, it, it has a meaning that renders just or innocent. It means to, to do justice. It means to vindicate. So Jesus is more direct when he says that it is about his righteousness. Now, I think that I have found myself at times trying to outrighteous God. And I do that in, in many and varying ways in outrighteousing God. I'm going to do one step better. In legalism, 
and legalism, what we do is when you have a certain law, we, we do that and then we do add, add more because we want to be righteous and we want to be overly righteous. So I find, yes, yeah, yeah, so we can do that. Uh, sometimes we, we might try to be overgive God. I mean, you think, well, how, how can you do that? Well, you think sometimes I'll, I'll be better then. Uh, we might even think that we can forgive better than God. We can do a better job. Well, if I were God, I, I'd do this. I'd do that. I'd intervene here. I mean, uh, as with kids, you know, if you have your own kids, sometimes you, you might even want to bail them out of a situation. And, but the question would be, would, would God bail them out of this particular situation? And if he would, how would he bail them out? And we might do it by, well, if God were God, he'd give me more money. And, I, you know, I'd win the lottery and then I, I could do all these good things if this happened. Well, again, like God, all, was a, God Almighty, you know, and, and he wins the lottery, but everybody wins the lottery. Nobody has, everybody has a buck and then everybody's mad at God again. So we can outrighteous God. So God's righteousness, again, the point I want to make here, or I'll throw it out, I want you to think about it. God's righteousness is far more than being right. And being right, I'm going to suggest, is not always righteous. So we have to stop and think about being right is not always righteous. And right and righteousness don't always equate. So I want to give an example of this from Matthew chapter 20. And it's a valid example because it's Jesus who gives us this parable. In, in Matthew chapter 20, and he likens it, again, to the kingdom of heaven. And this is why these two things are imperative to keep together, and Jesus has them together. Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness. So he says here, beginning in verse 1 of Matthew 20, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into the vineyard. This is about a penny a day, which doesn't seem fair to us today in today's job market, but it, it, was, a, it was a good <coughs> amount of money in that day. And then about the third hour, he went out and he saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing, and he told them, you also go to work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So now, now he doesn't tell them the amount. He just says, I will do what is right by you. So as a worker, you're going to work and you don't know what your salary is going to be. You don't know what your pay is, uh, but we're going to go to work at least. And we'll, we'll make something as better than nothing. But he says he'll he'll be right in that. So he, he does that. So they went, and then he went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. And then about the eleventh hour, he went out, and he found still others standing around. And he asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. And he said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. And when the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said unto his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. And the workers who were hired about the eleventh hour came, and each received a denarius. This is good news. If they get a denarius, then if I've been working all day, this must be overtime pay. Now we're, we're so immediately, you know, there's things, it's happening, it happens in all of our minds. None of us would be exempt from that. We would be hopeful that we're going to get more, we're going to get a bonus on top of all of this. That's how I would think. And I'm just going to be so crazy enough to think that you would think the same way. And the like. 
So when he came to those who are hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received the denarius. And when they had received it, they began to grumble against the, the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. Now let's notice what Jesus has to say to these individuals. But he answered one of them, friend, uh, this is uh, just the fact he calls him friend, friend, I am not being unfair to you. Oh, now, now we're talking about fairness because we live. One of the things that young kids say all the time, but that's not fair. So I'm taking to the circus instead. We're not going to the fair. Anyhow, because life is like a circus, a three-ring circus. But that's not fair. So we've got to kind of ask ourselves the question here then, can God be righteous and unfair at the same time? Because it doesn't appear to, to me to be fair either in terms of, of fairness. Well, don't get ahead of the story yet. It, stay, stay with the unfairness part of it at the present time. That's not fair, getting ahead of us here and reading the story. See? See? And that's another thing that changes. When we know the story, we have answers. In life, we don't always know the story, and we're in the moment. We're in the moment, and so we're trying to stay there. He says, didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who has hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have, notice the word Jesus, don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? Now we're getting to some of the features that we're looking here in terms of seeking righteousness. Seeking righteousness, his righteousness, God's righteousness, is not always seeking what is right, but what is good, what is generous, what is gracious, and what God would do. So now let's, let's go from working to people that we know. We are all called to become sons of God. But this is apply the same principle here. But Abraham was thousands of years before us. And he lived longer. And he went through more things than you and I have gone through or will go through. And then we've got other people who have gone through things and difficulties and the like. Uh, so Abraham, let's just say Abraham comes to Jesus where the resurrection and Jesus says, uh, Abraham says to him, but I was first, and I need to be more than that. And what Jesus is saying to him, I am ge- grace is about the generosity, the, the more than fairness of God. It is about his righteousness because we are not stepchildren. We are not half-children or quarter children, he brings us all in where his sons, his daughters, fully loved, fully reconciled, fully redeemed. We get the full payment of the blood of Christ. And even if you're the thief on the cross, you get the full reward. And as, as you know, and I've mentioned this before, the thief was just... Remember, remember me when you come to the kingdom and Jesus will respond, you shall be with me in paradise. And that's such a, to me, such an incredible jump from just kingdom to paradise because paradise speaks of the awesomeness of what God has. We sang about victory in Jesus in the streets of glory, all of gold, you know, beyond the crystal sea, all of those things. When we think about what God and his kingdom, what he's promised us is beyond our imagination. So when we look at this, this example appears to be unfair and not right to the laborers. But it is God's righteousness, His righteousness. Now, let's think for a moment that if 
they're complaining that they work through the heat of the day. Now, let me just throw up, give you two options. Which of these would you like to have late in the afternoon? Having worked from morning all day through the heat of the day with the knowledge that you're going to get a denarius when you get done with the work and you're going to be able to go out and buy a loaf of bread, you're going to be able to buy some drink, you're going to be able to provide for your family that evening. You can have that scenario at, let's say, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Or 3 in the afternoon, you're still standing there in the marketplace with nothing to do, no food for the family, no way to provide anything. The kids are hungry. They, so let's, let's put ourselves now as a Yemeni. If you've seen any of the pictures of the people in Yemen and the things they're going through through this warfare and all of that. So you're a Yemenite, a Yemeni, first man. And you've worked all day there in heat in Yemeni, in Ye Yemen rather. And you, and you have hope that this evening we're going to be able to fight for the kids whose ribs are showing and all of that. And there's hope for life for me, my family, and the like. Or you're the guy standing there at 3 o'clock in the afternoon saying, I'm going to have to go home. I'm going to hear my children cry. And I'm going to see my wife unable to feed us and have nothing. I'd rather go to the heat of the day. This is the mercy and the generosity and the, his righteousness. He gave them what they needed. God is so righteous in what we need. And I think that in life we have to recognize that God knows what we need through life. It's, it's kind of like when we pray, when we first pray about situations, we're to give God thanks for what He's already done, even though we haven't seen it. And God knows what our needs are, and, and, and God's going to to carry us through. And, and we have this strong belief that God is righteous. See, so it impacts, God's righteousness impacts our relationships, both with God and man. And what is the His righteousness all about? Well, when Jesus was at what, one of the great commandments, he says, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and being. Love your neighbors yourself. So how does his righteousness affect our forgiveness? Oh, well, you've only repented for two days. Uh, so, you're, well, I'm going to forgive you 2%. You're 2% forgiven and the rest of the time, you know, the other 98%, you're just saying live with the fact that you're not forgiven. Or how about his righteousness who gives us totally, completely, paid in full. Paid in full. How about his grace? Oh, uh, uh, unmerited favor. In our righteousness, what we, in our personal righteousness, what is righteous when it comes to leave, you need to pay the full price. You need to pay it all. It's like with, with vengeance. You know, we, God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. The problem with us as human beings, when it comes to vengeance, we don't know when to stop. We don't actually know when to start, or do we know when to start? So when we look at His, His grace that He has given to us, and I I just continue to marvel at how God, for Jesus forgave and how he encouraged people who he had given sin and told them to move on with a, with a life, with a life. And then we think about salvation itself. It isn't just his righteousness, but the righteousness of Christ gives us salvation, full sonship, full grace, full salvation, full redemption, full everything. And we truly, fully belong and are accepted. Now, man's righteousness, and there, there is a righteousness of man, uh, but it tells us in Isaiah 64 about man's righteousness is as un, unfilthy rags. You know, it, it isn't man's righteousness. He talked about, Paul talks about, there's none righteous, no, not one. Now, 
because there's none righteous doesn't mean that we don't seek righteousness because he tells us to seek righteousness he tells us that and he reminds us that our righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Well, they had it all down pat, had every law, they had it all pigeonholed in the line. But it isn't about that kind of righteousness that comes from legalism. It's the righteousness of Christ Jesus, his righteousness, and how he treats people. Jesus tells us that we are to hunger and thirst after righteousness, and if we do, we will be filled. So in this world, when we think about what's going on, as we seek the kingdom of God, we're seeking something that is totally different than the kingdoms around us. When we're seeking righteousness, it is not our own righteousness. It is what God's righteousness is. Because we can be right and totally wrong. An example, I've given this example before. you got the green light. You see the guy coming the other direction, and it's obvious he's not going to stop. So, well, I got the green light, and I'm going through no matter what, and you get killed. You're dead right, exactly. <laughs> the point well taken, you are dead right. What would a righteous person do? That's how you avoid accidents. Because everybody's not always right. Some people are just, I mean, but you stop. You don't cause it. Again, so we find this in Jesus. Now, the other part about righteousness is faith. It takes faith in God to be righteous. You have to trust He knows what He's doing. And so when we read Romans 1, 16 and 7, it's the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. We have to believe that in all things, that there's not one thing that God has not been righteous in. Now, do we understand it? Not necessarily. It doesn't seem righteous for me, to me in a way, for God to put a tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden. Make it easier, Lord, than do that. It doesn't appear. It doesn't appear righteous for me and, and right for God to tell Abraham, go kill your son that I promised you. Give. But there is a righteousness in the faith of trusting God and that everything he has done. We can look back on our own personal history and it doesn't, it doesn't seem, and I'll use Paul's example, it doesn't seem righteous on God's part to let Paul do all that Paul did knowing he was going to call him over here. It doesn't seem righteous. There is something about how God has a righteousness in the way He's teaching us, leading us, and His whole purpose. But we can we cannot trust God and not have faith in Him. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. And, and Romans 3 tells us we seek a righteousness that is apart from the law, but is through Christ Jesus our Lord. Doing God's will is about doing righteousness. You see, because in each and every day, we don't... You know, it's like, well, I, I got all the answers to everything. And all the answers sometimes will not be right when you're seeking God's will. What would God want me to do, and how would he want me to do it? If you were the foreman, what would you have paid? Probably, brother, I see it as, as us. Uh, I see myself as doing this, prorating the pay. Oh, there's an exception to this. If one of them was my relative, my son, or my daughter, I might make a bit of a exception. exception. Well, I got a little left over. I'll give you a full denarius. See, God across the board gave them all that. So, and righteousness has its works. It's, it's how we live our life, and that's what we're talking about. We live by the Spirit and not by the flesh. So in Peter, in 2 Peter, it talks about faithful brethren who look to the righteousness of God through Jesus. We look to his righteousness. So Jesus tells us what our response is to seek righteousness. Brethren, it, it's about seeking God's will. How would God do something? What is his righteousness? And it may not appear to be right in the moment. It may not appear to us to be righteous to forgive somebody we don't like and we don't want to forgive. And it may not appear righteous to tell them, go and have a life and enjoy it, be in good cheer. I forgive you, but I'll never forget. We, we, we tack that on. 
you know, to make them you know, forgive you and move on. His righteousness, I'm telling you, brother, is not easy. But it is, that's what we seek, is the righteousness of God in our life, and that's in our life, and that's how we're to live. So let's think about that, conclude in prayer, and seek His righteousness. Father in heaven, thank you so very much for your loving kindness, your righteousness that we find in your Son through your Spirit, Father. We ask also to be as your Son is. May we truly seek your kingdom, first of all, and your righteousness to your glory, not our own. And in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. The world today is a challenging environment for Christian believers and followers of Jesus Christ. Looking for answers? Grace Communion International Local Churches in Fairfield, Santa Rosa, and Modesto offers a comforting environment for Christians in search of spiritual growth and development. Contact a local ministry. Attend a local GCI churches at the times listed on your screen.